So I will talk, talk about a type of unsupervised learning called generative quantum models. Uh, I will talk about the issue of barren plateaus. That is one of the main key problems that prevent trainability of variational circuits and quantum machine learning models. And towards the end, I will talk about the application of our algorithm on learning thermal state. So when people talk about quantum machine learning, they usually, the story usually goes like this. We know that quantum is very powerful. It can outperform traditional computation and machine learning is having success in all spheres of the life. So just putting these two very, very powerful concepts together must be even stronger than some of these parts, right? It's just a no brainer to take two very strong approaches and combine them. But the question is that if we put them together, would they work together as a cherry pie vanilla ice cream? Or do we end up with some crazy monster that is that where the where the individual parts really just fight together and it doesn't really make any sense whatsoever to combine them? Um, and uh, to be completely fair, so far we don't really know. We have some successes in quantum machine learning. But the really big, pro big problem that prevents us from really assessing the true power of quantum machine learning is that we don't really have large quantum computers yet. And we cannot simply run a large quantum machine learning model on a big data set and compare it with traditional machine learning models. Uh, so what we have to do instead is either do a theoretical analysis and try to prove some theorems, propose some algorithms based on what we know from other areas of quantum computing and quantum information, and then try to do some small instance demonstrations to test our ideas as far as we can, either run them on the small computers, the quantum computers that we have now, or what we can still numerically simulate. Uh, what I find particularly interesting uh, about quantum machine learning is that unlike the traditional machine learning approaches, we can learn directly from the quantum state. We could have some quantum information coming directly from a quantum computer and then process it on a quantum machine learning algorithm. So this information can be, for example, an output of some a uh, linear solver or some other algorithm that uses a lot of linear algebra. And similarly, we can also take some classical data, feed them into our quantum computer, and then have the, qu the quantum computer itself to learn how to generate some class of quantum state. And this is, of course, not really possible for cr classical computers because those cannot manipulate or create quantum states directly. Uh, we have different quantum machine learning models that are usually to some extent inspired by classical machine learning models. Um, and one that I will talk about is what can be seen as a quantum version of a feed forward neural network. So in, uh, uh, and th but this is just a very loose inspiration for what we call, we'll call a quantum unitary neural network, or some would call it also just a variational, uh, variational quantum circuit. And the analog here is that instead of having weights and biases that a classical network would try to learn, we will try to learn parameters of quantum gate. So our unitary quantum neural network will be a quantum circuit with some parameterized gates. Uh, for simplicity, we will see them all as uh, rotation around some simple Hamiltonians, but with unknown angles that we are trying to learn. Um, and uh, we will be evaluati evaluating an objective function, which is typically a Hermitian operator that is defined on some subset of the qubits. Uh, we will also, introduce a, a naming convention that it's similar to uh, what people are using in classical neural networks. 
Um, the unit where we will be evaluating the objective function would be called, uh, uh, will be called visible units. And any ancillary qubits will correspond to, to so-called hidden units. And then the goal of learning would be to, the goal of training will be to learn these parametrized circuits, the parametrized unitary, such that it will minimize the objective function of define on the visible units. So the big question is, can we have actually efficiently train these models? Are we actually able to learn and uh, find these good parameters that would meet, uh, lead to small objective functions? The most common type of training will be is based on gradient descent. And in order to make the training uh, efficient, we need to have two components that are both efficient. So first, uh, every time we are estimating a, a gradient, uh, this, compute, this computation of gradient uh, must be efficient. It can take at most polynomial steps to estimate the gradient to sufficient precision. And second, we need to have an algorithm that will converge sufficiently quickly such that the number of steps our algorithm will need to find a good enough solution will be at most polynomial. Um, so I, I'm sure I don't really need to explain how gradient descent works, but uh, the broad idea is that ev uh, everywhere we are, where we are in the optimization landscape or the manifold that can be seen as defined by the objective function. Uh, wherever we are, we will just follow the gradient, go down as in a, the steepest way possible. Uh, however, if we find ourselves in an area where the gradient is pretty much zero, our algorithm will get stuck. Uh, from the, any other point from the neighborhood of our point isn't really significantly better. Um, and our algorithm wouldn't, won't be learning. It won't be improving the objective function anymore. And if we find ourselves in an area with gradients that, it, that with a gradient that is zero or exponentially close to zero, we will say that we are in a barren plateau. Uh, barren plateaus is something that is unfortunately extremely common in quantum neural networks. The first barren, gradient, barren plateaus were reported by the team from Google in deep uh, variational circuits. Uh, later, Cerezo et al. showed that if you have a shallow circuit, but the, the cost function is what they call global, the gradient will be zero for almost all parameters, except for a very, very narrow subset of them. And my collaborators and I uh, recently also show that the entanglement between our measured qubits, the visible qubits, and NA and SILAS can also re lead to a type of a barren plateau. So entanglement can, all, can not only help us, but it can also hurt us but by significantly decreasing the gradient that we are try, trying to measure. Um, and the thing that is key here, and it is quite different from the vanishing gradients that people experience sometimes when they train classical neural networks, is that quantum algorithms typically start at the barren plateau. So once we initialize our variational circuit, we almost always find, us, find ourselves in a barren plateau and we won't be able to improve our initial guess, guess uh, by much. Let me quickly, oh, okay. Um, this, this seems to be a really large problem that was pointed out by Zoe Holmes and her collaborators last year. Uh, if we are looking at uh, quantum neural networks that I just defined, we would need to make a trade-off between expressivity and trainability. So what does this work 
shows is that if we create a model, a variational quantum circuit that will be very expressive, it will able to explore the Hilbert space and lead to very, very accurate models. Um, such that this type of an architecture would be B-cubic complete. These uh, models would be also very difficult to train because they would be running into barren plateaus uh, statistically all the time. Um, so this is a really, really big problem. And the natural question that many people are asking is, is there a way out? Is there anything we can do to either escape a better plateau or never arrive into one? Um, so as my co uh, collaborators and I were deriving our results on the entanglement based barren plateau, we noticed that our results and many other results make an assumption that is often unstated, which is that the objective function is defined by a Hermitian matrix with a bounded infinity norm. Um, and this is actually really, really natural because there is just you know, some Hermitian matrix that we would be measuring. And if we want to make all of our, you know, we have a simple quantum circuit, then this Hermitian operator, of course, would be bounded. However, uh, what we showed in this work is that if we show an, if we choose an unbounded objective function that would have simple enough gradients, we might be able, at least in some cases, not to ever enter a barren plateau. Uh, and this idea has actually a very, uh, is very natural. And it, the motivation for it comes from traditional machine learning. Uh, so for those who are checking emails all the time and you don't really have the attention span to watch the entire talk, the main message is that barren plateau results don't apply to unbounded objective functions. There might be still some other barren plateaus that we don't know about yet, but all the existing results only apply to objective functions that are bounded. Um, so let me tell you what can be done if we look in unbounded objective functions. So in classical machine learning, the objective function that we are trying to minimize is scale, uh, is scale divergence. It tells us about the loss, the information we are losing if we are using a model distribution instead of the true distribution of the data. Of course, uh, we never actually compute this objective function, and we know that it is computationally difficult to, to compute it. So instead, um, machine learning experts only estimate the gradient through sampling and only need to know their, their, their objective function is always decreasing even though they never really compute uh, the, the KL divergence directly. So is there something as a KL divergence, quantum KL divergence? Yes, of course it is. Um, one could define a quantum relative entropy that can be seen as a generalization of KL divergence. And then you could in principle try to compute its gradients, either by computing relative entropy directly or by just you know, doing the uh, calculus and try to derive an expression. The problem with quantum relative entropy is that it is, again, very inefficient to measure it directly. And second, the gradients do not have a simple form because we have some logarithms of density matrices multiplied by a density matrix. And due to the non commutativity of operators in quantum mechanics, uh, this does, the gradients don't really lead to close expression, especially if we have some ancillary qubits involved. 
So instead of looking at quantum relative entropy, um, in our work, we considered maximum quantum Rayleigh divergence for alpha equals two. Um, many of you might know that there is this no, infinite amount of Rayleigh divergences for all different values of al alpha. And the alpha equals two case, uh, upper, uh, upper bound scale divergence and also quantum relative entropy. But so it, uh, it can be still seen as a valid objective function. Um, and uh, what we liked about this expression specifically is that uh, all of the quantum, uh, we don't really need to worry about non-commutativity in, in this case, because um, we will be, we, we, we won't be taking logarithms of operators, only a logarithm of a scalar. So uh, the reason why we chose it is that we looked through over a quantum information textbook, and this was an objective function that made sense from an information theoretical perspective, but it was simple enough for us to work with. Um, similarly, as for KL divergence, we won't be computing it directly, and we will be only com we will be only looking at the gradient. And also, as a divergence, uh, maximal quantum Rayleigh divergence it's not symmetric. But if both of the density matrices are full rank, uh, we know that it doesn't matter which way we take it. Uh, once we will reach uh, zero, zero divergence, this can happen even only if our model and our, uh, our data will be the same. So in, uh, for some computational reasons, in some cases, we might switch the order of data and model in the mathematical expression for D2. Um, in the, the expression in the red rectangle, uh, you can notice that it requires us to compute an inverse, which can be done through block encoding. However, for this, we would need to use uh, a fault tolerant quantum computer and algorithms such as HGL or something, again, that would require a relatively large number of gates. However, uh, we can compute the query complexity uh, of our algorithm. So the number of times we would need to have access to uh, the quantum data set and uh, uh, give some estimates on a single computation of the gradient. Uh, the technique we are using in estimating all of these gradients is something we called an extended swap test that might be uh, interesting for people who create quantum algorithms. So this technique combines the swap test, the swap test and the Hadamar test. And we also extended it to involve not only one or two registers, but arbitrary number. And using, using this generalization of swap test and Hadamar test allows us to compute the trace of an arbitrary product between unitaries and density matrix. So if you would like to compute, let's say, trace of a polynomial of some density matrices, then extended swap test is uh, what, you, what you can use. Um, we applied our technique on learning thermal states, which is an interesting playgrounds for people in quantum computing. So uh, if you talk to a physicist, they will probably tell you that thermal states are very, very easy to prepare and something they have in the lab all the time and thermalization is happening whether they want it or not. However, we also know that creating thermal state is a computationally hard problem. And depending on how you state it, it can be seen as a generalization of uh, ground state estimation 
or a sharp P problem. Um, so uh, we can say that creating thermal states can be hard, but for many physical systems, thermalization takes place, place naturally, especially if we are looking at uh, higher temp at thermal states with higher temperatures. The reason why we chose uh, thermal states for our algorithms is that instead of having access to thermal states directly as a training set, training set uh, we allow our algorithm only the access to an LCU decomposition of the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian that would uh, the, define the training state, the, the thermal state, uh, we would have access to the individual the terms uh, uj through an oracle, and we also would have access to the uh, coefficients alpha. And in this case, computing, at least now formally, the uh, inverse of the state would be easy, formally. Um, we get, we proposed uh, two different algorithms. One that is sort of shallow and it uses sampling. I'm intentionally not using the word NISC to describe it, uh, which is even though we prioritize the shallow depth, it's not a, a, an algorithm that would be well suited for quantum computers that we have now. And the second algorithm that you can find in our paper improves the complexity of the first one by using LCU and amplitude estimation instead of sampling. Um, the, in, the great thing about our gradient is that at no point it needs to compute the partition function because of the, the fractional form here. Uh, all the the uh, the partition functions will simply cancel each other, and we will use an approximation of the exponential by Taylor series that will can be uh, truncated to some extent. Um, and uh, in the analysis, we also need to ensure that the body no the nominator and the denominator here would be bounded away from zero. Um, our shallow algorithm consists of several steps. In the very beginning on the bottom four registers, we would implement two copies of our quantum neural networks. Then on one copy of uh, the neural network, we will implement the terms from the LCU decomposition of our Hamiltonian conjugated by, uh, by the terms coming from our quantum neural network. Um, and uh, oh, oh, sorry, we will apply terms from the quantum neural network with some conjugation. And we also need to apply uh, some of the unit trace that define this Hamilton, the Hamiltonian that defines the density matrix as, as their controlled version. Um, afterwards, we are using a control swap, um, which comes from the version of the exp uh, extended swap test, as well as some uh, Hadamard gate and a measurement. So because of the use of a controlled swap, uh, this will be quite difficult to, uh, and the controlled unit trace, this can be quite difficult to create on quantum computers in the very near future. To make our algorithms more efficient uh, in the long run, uh, instead of estimating each uh, term uh, through sampling, we can also prepare a superposition over all the terms that would come, come into the gradient computation. And instead, and instead of sampling, one can we can use amplitude amplification. So this computation of the computation of a single gradient is efficient if the temperature 
of the thermal state is high enough. But of course, once we are going to the lower temperatures, our algorithm um, uh, wouldn't be efficient. And in this case, if the goal is really to prepare some ground states, uh, there are better quantum algorithms out there. Also, it should be stressed that even if computation of a single gradient would be efficient, we don't have any uh, formal a uh, former proof that the gradient, the gradient descent would still uh, converge efficiently to the solution. Uh, we run our algorithm mm, numerically in cases with a handful of visible units and an increasing number of hidden units. And what we were very happy to see is as we were increasing the number of hidden units in our quantum neural network, the, uh, the approximation kept improving. We were able to increase, we were able to decrease the, the loss function. Uh, this is quite different than what we would see with traditional techniques with variational quantum neural networks where increasing the number of hidden units would very quickly lead to a, a barren plateau. And with a high number of hidden units, we wouldn't be able to train at all. We also compare the loss function with the fidelity. And we saw that if we are decreasing the loss, in uh, which is defined as uh, the quantum rate divergence, our fidelity in indeed increasing. Um, we were really happy about the, this result. However, there's a lot of questions that we weren't allowed, weren't able to answer. First, uh, it is entirely possible that there are other barren plateaus that appear even with unbounded objective functions. Uh, second, we weren't able to rigorously bound the convergence. And even though we show that under some conditions, one might be able to avoid the barren plateau, uh, we still don't know exactly how quickly our algorithm converges and how realistic our barren plateau avoidance conditions would be for many uh, common algorithms. Um, we still, we don't know if there is any noise tolerance and if these algorithms could be uh, suited for near-term quantum, quantum computers uh, and if there can be any error mitigation techniques that one could avoid. And we don't have really exact conditions on the gradients being efficiently computed and large. Lastly, it would be really interesting to answer what states can we learn. In this work, we specifically focused on thermal states with higher energies, uh, with higher temperature, uh, sorry. But uh, this was only something we you know, studied numeric numerically and through our uh, theoretical analysis of uh, computations of the gradients. Uh, even though we were specifically focusing on unsupervised training, we suggest that unsupervised learning could be used uh, as a first step of supervised learning. So as I mentioned earlier, better plateaus are something that, that arises due to poor initialization. If you initialize your variational circuit randomly, uh, you will almost certainly run into a better plateau. So uh, if you tr want to train your variational quantum circuit for some supervised task, uh, one uh, approach would be to first run a, to, the one approach would be to run it in two phases. First, uh, one could, start by doing something called a generative pre-training to train the quantum neural network for a task that is somehow similar. 
uh, first to teach the circuit to recreate the training data. And this would create an initialization that is not random, but it would be somehow closely, somehow related to the final task. And then in the second step, uh, one could perform supervised fine tuning, taking the pre-initialized uh, weights from phase one. Uh, we can use them as a warm start for training for the specific tasks. This type of pre-training and fine tuning is used in ma traditional machine learning quite a bit, and it's and it's generally people generally expect and see that this warm start tends to perform better than just initializing parameters randomly. So to summarize, um, trainability is very important central question in quantum machine learning. And if we are not constructing our quantum machine learn learning models carefully, uh, one would almost certainly run into a barren plateau. Uh, creating objective functions that would be uh, different from, uh, from the traditional, just measure some simple Hermitian operators can uh, at least formally break one of the assumptions under barren plateau results. But uh, even after our work, we still don't have any rigorous guarantees that this technique would work. Um, but I think there is a reason to be optimistic about, optimistic about the prospects of quantum machine learning. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer some questions.